I'm Julie Sullivan, president of the University of St. Thomas, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this first Friday luncheon. This is our initial luncheon in a 25-year series. We have been doing first Friday lunches for 25 years now, and we continue to feature engaging, insightful business, government, and thought leaders, and today, of course, is no exception. Can you feel the energy on the campus? And in this room, we decorate the Anderson Student Center every time Dennis comes to see us. No, uh, clearly there's a lot of energy here because of our speaker and our desire to engage with him and hear from him. But this also is the beginning of homecoming and family weekend. So you will see many things around campus that are welcoming our families and our alumni back to campus. And I want to give a very, very special welcome to any parents or family members who are joining our alumni luncheon today. Thank you for being with us. I also want to welcome home alumni who are here to gather with your classmates. I always enjoy my interactions with Tommy alumni. You are always share your gratitude for your experience here. You often share perhaps how things have changed. You share the beauty of the campus, but you also share how things have not changed in that we continue to embrace our mission of advancing the common good, and we continue that personalized education of the whole person. So thank you for all you're doing out in your communities to promote that St. Thomas spirit of advancing the common good. Before we move to the main program, I'm going to give some very, very brief highlights about what's happening at the university today. Uh, we welcomed 1,622 new first-year students this fall, so that's over 1,600. <laughs> that is the largest freshman class we've ever had in our history. It also is 230 more than we welcomed last year, and uh, almost 200 more than we were anticipating welcoming this year. So uh, the good news is they all have a place to sleep that has some access to a restroom. <laughs> uh, and so in addition to the hard work of our enrollment management staff and all of our marketing and communication staff at the University of St. Thomas, I attribute that robust enrollment just as much to people like you in this room today. Because we have found out that 53% of the students who matriculate at St. Thomas heard about us from a family member or a friend. So you are our best ambassadors, and we ask you, please keep spreading the word. It's working. I also want to tell you about three other brief new things that are happening on campus. Uh, we have a new dean of our School of Education. Kathleen Holmes Campbell. And Dean Campbell would be with us today, except she's at the Gates Foundation. She is one of the only higher ed leaders in the state of Minnesota invited to a conference that's going on today about the future of teacher preparation. And we are so excited about her leadership. She has brought a fresh energy, a fresh excitement, a new vision for our School of Ed. She has really uh, excited our faculty there, and they're transforming what we're doing to prepare teachers. Some of the highlights of what they're doing is improving our teacher candidate curriculum, making it more innovative, more relevant. Partnerships, strong partnerships with our local Catholic schools and local school districts, and fully embracing the teacher residency model. And our goal, and I believe our very realistic goal, is to be a national leader in teacher preparation at the University of St. Thomas. I think we'll be able to say that in the not too distant future. Secondly, our faculty and staff at the university and along with many of our board members and advisory members have been studying the possibility of opening a college of health at the university. We've made a decision to move forward with that. We are very interested in being more involved in comprehensive integrated approaches to healthcare uh, we are going to be starting a College of Health that will include our current School of Social Work, our current School of Graduate Psychology, and a new school we will be launching, a new nursing school that will have undergraduate and graduate programs. Thank you. 
Our goal is to continue to fulfill the need for quality and comprehensive and integrated health care for every citizen in the state of Minnesota and beyond. And lastly, along those same lines, I want to say that we are opening a new center for well-being. We're very concerned about the well-being of our students in particular, but of course our faculty and staff as well. You've all heard a lot about the mental health crisis in this country and particularly how it is most poignant with our youngest group. It's most poignant actually right now with the ages of 18 to 22. Well, that's who we serve primarily in our undergraduate programs, but it's poignant among our entire adult population and extending down more and more into their childhood years. So we're opening a center for well-being that allows us to provide integrated health services that combines our physical health team, our mental health team, our resiliency team, our other wellness specialists in one building, but most importantly, in one team who are providing holistic care in particular to our students down to the point that they share the same record system. Data matters. If, you're, if everybody is looking at the same person with all the complete set of information from their, set, their lens and specialty, we'll provide more comprehensive and integrated care to our students. And our students can't get benefit from the fabulous education that we seek every day to provide if they're not healthy. So we're really excited about that. So we've started a great year. Uh, it's, we're very excited about all the new initiatives. And we're very excited about the history and the foundation that St. Thomas has provided us to build on each year. So before we, we're going to have lunch, before we hear from our guest speaker today, uh, Dennis. And before our lunch, I'd like to invite Father Larry Snyder, who's our Vice President for Mission, to lead us in a blessing, please. Good afternoon, and let us join in prayer. Lord God, and giver of all good gifts, we are grateful as we pause before this meal for all the blessings that you give to us. Daily, we are fed with good things, nourished by friendship, and feasted with forgiveness. We are grateful for this university where we have been educated and formed to be responsible leaders who work to build up the common good. We ask you to bless the students who currently follow that path. May they grow in wisdom and knowledge and a deepening of virtue and faith. Mindful of your continuous care, we are grateful for the blessings of this table and this time together. Bless the hands that have prepared this food and those that serve it. Always keep in your special care those that we carry in our hearts and those who are most in need of your love and mercy this day. And in that spirit we pray together, bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts which we are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Good afternoon again. I hope you enjoyed your lunch and clearly you're enjoying your table conversation, uh, but it is now time to move on uh, to our program and I know you're all eagerly anticipating our speaker today. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dennis McDonough. From February 2013 until January 2017, Dennis served as White House Chief of Staff for President Obama, where he managed the 4,000-member White House staff, as well as cabinet secretaries and agency leaders. Prior to that, he served as Assistant to the President and Principal Deputy National Security Advisor. Currently, Dennis is Senior Principal at the Markle Foundation. In this role, he is working to address the skills gap, particularly in light of looming artificial, the looming artificial intelligence revolution. He also currently serves as an Executive Fellow at the University of Notre Dame's Keough School of Global Affairs, where he teaches a global policy seminar. We would all feel lucky to be able to be a student in that class. Dennis grew up in Stillwater, Minnesota. He received his undergraduate degree from St. John's University, the one in Minnesota, <laughs> and in 
and his master's from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. Dennis is a very proud Johnny, and I must, you know, be honest, it's pretty rare that we start our first Friday speaker series lunch <laughs> by inviting a Don Johnny to speak to our St. Thomas alumni gathering, particularly on alumni and family weekend and homecoming and all of that. But you know, Dennis is special. Dennis is very special. Like the rest of Minnesota, we are so proud of his work and we're so proud of his service to our country and now to our young people. Dennis has very strong family ties to many people in this room and to the University of St. Thomas. Illustrated by two of his kids, Adeline and Liam. <laughs> This is a surprise for Dennis, these, these slides here. But uh, <laughs> he, didn't, he did not approve this, but he might like the next one because we want to reach across the aisle and say, actually, they're also pretty big Johnny fans. And we want to be role models in today's polarized world to say we can find ways to come together. So please welcome our favorite Johnny, Dennis McDonough. Very nice. Uh, you know, continuing, obviously a day, especially like today, with everything going on in the world, I, I thought it was important to, to recognize um, that, you know, our country is more and more polarized and, you know, we're breaking down into tribes, everybody says. And so I thought it was important for me to start my conversation recognizing that to say something uh, that I thought I'd never say, which is it's really good to be at St. Thomas. <laughs> uh, Julie, thanks so much. It's been a real uh, treat to get to know you in the last year and a half. And uh, uh, I'm really proud of my family's association with St. Thomas, uh, my brothers, uh, my sister-in-law now, the only two uh, Tommies in the crew. Um, and it's a special place in a special place. That is to say, inside of Minnesota, uh, this is a very important institution. And that matters a lot to me. And um, I want to talk today a little bit about maybe the role that we all in this room can play on what I think is the major issue domestically facing the country. I'm going to fly through these slides because I mainly want to get to questions uh, from you all. And I want to start um, by recalling a phone call that President Obama got from Elon Musk. It's much in the news of late um, for not great reasons. But he's quite worried when he called him. And uh, first of all, I wasn't inclined to think much of what he had to say about anything, but nevertheless, he called very concerned about artificial intelligence. He's worried that machines were developing minds of their own, that in fact, absent aggressive and timely regulatory action from the federal government, that we'd be facing a massive challenge. And I think to myself, yeah, I think this guy's kind of out there. Uh, as has now been proven over the course of the last couple of weeks. <laughs> but maybe he's on to something. So of course, I started to get very worried about this phone call, <laughs> having grown up knowing Arnold Schwarzenegger before he's governor of California and thinking, oh my god, Elon Musk is about to warn us that we're on top of some pretty major challenge. But as much as I think his concerns about particular artificial intelligence, as they call it, artificial intelligence that develops a mind of its own, as much as his concerns about that are overblown, I think his con general concern about artificial intelligence is probably well-founded. I was in New York about a year ago, and we went to the Watson Institute, uh, the Wa Watson office of IBM, and we saw this machine, Watson. 
Well, there we are briefed that 90% of the data in the current ecosystem right now has been created in the last two years. 90% of the data in the ecosystem has been created in the last two years. Now, when we were in the White House, as we left, we transferred to the, United, uh, the archives of the United States, to the archivist of the United States, 565 million electronic records. 565 million electronic records generated over eight years. None of those records is included in that 90% of data created in the last two years. So this data is being generated at an amazing pace, and that data is the fuel for artificial intelligence. So what does that mean, artificial intelligence? Science Magazine claimed this game of Go between a South Korean national named Lee Sedol and a machine created by Google DeepMind was the science breakthrough of 2016. Until that time, that fell on the right, Lee Sedol has, was the Go champion, world champion, 18 times over. Go is a game with many more pieces and much more strategy than chess. So humans have been inclined to think that machines couldn't beat a human at such a complex game that required such strategy. Well, 18-time world champion took on AlphaGo, lost five games in a row. 18-time world champion went 0-5 against a machine in Go. What the Google DeepMind engineers told him at the time was, we programmed this game and what we did is we had it run millions and millions of simulations of what moves to make at each point in the game. And being able to play that over and over again made the game pretty good. But they said something interesting is happening now. We can start the game, but we don't know which move DeepMind or AlphaGo will make at any particular moment. So the machine itself is making strategy decisions about this very complex game. So the question for us as people in this economy that's increasingly reliant on technology is, what does that mean? What does that mean for our kids that we're educating? What does that mean for the economies that we operate in? What does it mean in the businesses that we're building? We've been through a big change like this before, when we went from an agrarian to an urban society with the invention of engines, the steam engine. And what you saw, as this graph shows, is going from an economy where 90% of the people are involved in agriculture, 65, 70% of the people are involved in agriculture, down to where we are today in the United States, where 2% of our workers are involved in farms. 2%. We still generate plenty of food, and in fact, we export food, the biggest food exporter in the world. What does that mean, then, for this change in jobs? What are my kids, those two that you saw and the one that you didn't, uh, wearing those very colorful shirts? <laughs> what does it mean for them? Estimates are all over the map, but what I consider to be the most credible study is by the McKinsey Company. They claim that 30% of the tasks in 60% of the jobs that are currently known to us all over the world, 30% of the tasks that you do, they're going to be replaced by machines. So think to yourself for a second. One third of your time today is going to be handed over to a computer. Or it could mean that maybe one third of the jobs that you have in your company are going to be taken over by a computer. Or it surely means that what we do in our job every day is going to change. And what you're going to expect of your people is going to change, and where you're going to invest in machines is going to change. What are the kinds of activities that are going to be replaced? What are the kinds of activities that are going to be additive? And what does that matter? 
So if you look at this slide, the things where we're going to add activities are the kinds of things that students at the University of St. Thomas are spending their time learning. Expertise, interacting with humans, valuing human interaction, treating people with dignity, being able to react to unforeseen or unpredictable outcomes. The things where we're going to see work hours replaced, machines doing what humans do, are predictable activities, physical activities, repeatable activities. You know what that means? That means the economy is going to change for a lot of people, and I'll talk in a minute about who it's most likely going to change for. Now, let's go back to St. Thomas for a second, because what we know about artificial intelligence is what it does well, it does really well. And what it does badly, it does super badly. Here's three examples. Thought that sock on the left was an Indian elephant. Okay? Thought that collection of colors in the middle box was a school bus. And then the third was a king penguin. So when artificial intelligence is wrong, it's really wrong. And where is it wrong? It's wrong in all the places where St. Thomas is training students to be right in making decisions when there's an absence of information rather than an abundance of it. Making decisions when you're trying to choose between interests of people who you care about, people who you want to have chances, who, who you want to create opportunity for. Or as I said a minute ago, questions where you lack important information. Because all that information that's been pumped into the international data ecosystem that we talked about at the beginning, that's not going to have all the answers. Now, this was a really interesting day in this photo. The most interesting thing happened well after this, which was President Obama making a decision whether to say publicly that the United States had found Osama bin Laden. Why is that interesting? Well, because we didn't know for sure. We thought so. Everything that we had planned for indicated that that must have been him. But he didn't have his driver's license or his social security card. And I'll tell you what, you don't want to be wrong if you're going out to say that you got him. You don't want to be the President of the United States and go out and say, I got this creep. And the next morning, he's on CNN. But you also don't want to refuse to say you got him and give a bunch of people on the other side of the world, remember, when he makes the decision of whether to acknowledge we got bin Laden, it's late Sunday evening. So we're going to bed. But Pakistan's just waking up. And do you want to give the bad guys all night to propagate lies about whether, in fact, we got their leader. Tough call. A tough call because of the absence of information that requires reasoning and consideration and strategy. So if St. Thomas is training the workers and managers of the future to operate in this kind of economy that's farming out automatable tasks. What's going to happen to workers and to economies in the United States? Well, I'll tell you what, this set of slides, uh, this slide tells you that people and the skills they have are going to experience this differently. Somebody with less than a high school degree is going to be much more dramatically and negatively impacted by an economy that's moving towards artificial intelligence and automation than somebody with a bachelor's or a graduate degree. Moreover, our societies will be, changed, will be impacted by this. Right now, all that data that's being pumped into the international ecosystem, pumped into Facebook and 
your Twitter feed. Some of it's well-meaning horsing around, but some of it is deliberate obfuscation and disinformation from our country's most steadfast enemies, the world's biggest intelligence forces, trying to confuse us. So not only do we need to make sure that people who will be impacted by this change have opportunity for new jobs, but that they become in this hypercharged economy and environment more sophisticated consumers of all this the data that's being dumped out in the economy, in the, into the ecosystem. So what does that mean for Minnesota? Quite aside from just here at St. Thomas. Well, even in a high-performing state like ours, where college, four-year college degree attainment is on the higher end among states in the country, it's still only three in 10 workers who get a college degree. Slice it a different, different way, and you see just how limited a college degree, in fact, is. What does that mean, then, for outcomes? We know this is true. As you get more educated, not only do you get to be a more discerning consumer of all this information, and not only will you be able to defend yourself as we get into an economy that's increasingly reliant on machines, but you're better remunerated. You have greater likelihood of being employed. You have an opportunity to pursue the American dream. So we know that to succeed in this economy, you need more training, you need more education. And where are they going to get it? It used to be that you'd get training on the job. You get training from your employer. You see here, even in Minnesota, those numbers are going down. Employers aren't providing that training, even at a moment when we need it more than ever, and our businesses need it more than ever. So the answer is right here at St. Thomas. You see versions of it here on the main campus. You see a uh, version of it over at uh, Alvin's work uh, on the other side of town. We need to make more college more attainable, more affordable for more people. More than three in 10. But we also have to make training more available for the seven in 10 who don't have a college degree. And we have to make that training not only more affordable, more attainable, but we have to make it more connected to actual employment so that people are getting trained in skills that are needed in the economy. And that when they're needed in the economy, they're getting jobs and the dignity and importantly, the pay that comes with those jobs. And just as that's what St. Thomas is doing here for those three and 10, and as you grow more of those three and 10 to college through Alvin's work at the Marco Foundation, we're urging that the labor market itself be modernized. So somebody, any, an individual worker is better able to, tra to trade his or her skills in the labor marketplace, not dependent on a degree or a diploma or some kind of certification, but actually depending on their ability to trade what they do, what they do well, and to make sure that it's properly remunerated. It's more important now than ever. The opportunities are boundless, as we see, including on this campus. But the challenges sometimes feel just as boundless. And until we're focused on that opportunity, um, will not see the kinds of societies and kinds of leadership uh, that we've come to appreciate uh, in this country over time. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much.
So I was told there, there, there'll be people with microphones, and I've been told to wait uh, for the questions because they can't hear you can't hear them without the microphones. Yeah, here in the back. Hi, thank you for being here today. Um, I had a couple questions. In those um, graphs that you're talking about when um, you show the associate's degrees and yeah. um, you know, shorter college terms, um, do you guys take into account the displacement of workers who would be actually doing the customer support and technical maintenance on stuff like this in which you know, shorter degree periods may be even um, better for that type of thing and probably those people that are in those associate and technical tracks would be displacing the the workers at that higher level? Uh, it's a fair point, and uh, I'd have to go look at it. Since it wasn't our study, I can't speak to the methodology per se. But So I, I'll take that and go look at it. But I, short answer is I don't have an answer to that. Cool, thanks. I'll leave it to you guys with the mics uh, to go wherever we were close here. So I have two questions. One is, uh, what is your prediction of the outcome of the Tommy Johnny game uh, a week from tomorrow? It's easy. So how many points are you giving us? Look, it's, uh, all I can tell you is from, ex I, I, I think data is important, experience is important. My experience was three and one against Tommy, so I don't know. Well, t we'll just say times have changed, however. So, and I'll just say, hope springs eternal, baby. <laughs> so uh, I, 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 too, have little respect for Elon Musk, but uh, how concerned should we be about uh, safeguards to uh, stop a uh, Terminator ap apocalypse due to artificial intelligence? Uh, it's, a good, it's a fair question, and I, I shouldn't have been as uh, smug as I was about him. I think he's raising a real, realistic question, which is uh, weaponry, uh, is maybe the place where we're seeing deployment of new technologies most aggressively. Just think about uh, the deployment of unmanned aerial vehicles, or uh, what are commonly referred to as drones. Uh, it wasn't long ago that you would have thought that was science fiction. I think it's basically uh, very commonplace now, including for non-state actors, not only for the states, states like the United States and China and others to use that technology, but even non-state actors like the Islamic State. So um, I think it's right to be concerned about it. Um, I think the United States, as usual, is leading on questions like this. Um, and so uh, we should be concerned about it. Uh, but uh, with that concern should come intentionality around making sure that the same way that we've applied, say, uh, the just war teaching to how we conduct other business in the Pentagon, we should apply it to new technologies. And so a fundamental question there is, uh, who is who is the actor in the use of force? And um, at the end of the day, the just war th in theory envisions a human making that decision. And so as we deploy more and more of these machines, we should keep, as we say, a human in the loop on those decisions so that we're not farming out to an algorithm or to a machine, a decision about whether to use force. And I think if we stay true to our traditions on that, including the traditions that in the main come from our church, uh, I think we'll be OK. Sure, why don't we go over here? Uh, when you look at the relationship between public and private sector for responsibility for this dramatic need for in-service training. How do you see partnerships or rivalries to, uh, to meet the need nationally and internationally? I think it's a good question. And I think you see really interesting things all around the country. Uh, you don't see a lot of what Alvin's doing. Uh, in fact, that, that's only, as near as I can tell, happening in one place, which is expanding uh, very concretely through a two-year program access to four-year program. Uh, with a particular focus on diversity and on affordability. Um, but otherwise, you see individual cases around the country. Famous one is submarine builder in Connecticut, Electric Boat, has a relationship with a couple of local community colleges to train welders to 
help complete those submarines because they couldn't find certified welders. Um, that's useful and interesting and important uh, for that particular question. But to get, so that's a, a very simple public-private partnership on the local level. But to get to the kind of scale change that I think we need, I think you need the scale change and, and institutional change, um, systems change that I think needs to happen here to make training for the 70% more readily available, uh, more cheaply. I think you need the government involved. So I think this is an inherently governmental question. Uh, the experience should be taken from the private sector. Um, and I think that federal policymakers instinct to leave this to the corporations is a, is a, a dereliction of leadership on a very fundamental question. So I hope we'll see more action from Congress on this in the coming years. Uh, so far, uh, I don't see anything nearing or approximating the kind of action that I think we need. Yeah, in the back. Uh, there's long been a tension in higher education between the requisition model where we prepare people to meet the current needs of the world of work versus the broader model, we create good citizens, we create ethically grounded people, uh, people capable of, of dealing with all the change they will face in their lifetime. I thought I heard a tilt in your remarks to the, to the first mo model. Whether I did or not, how would you advise President Sullivan and the deans at St. Thomas to strike that balance? Yeah, so I'm a big liberal arts person. You, uh, you probably heard that come through. I think that uh, the most important skill uh, that I look to hire for is hunger. If I could hire hungry, I'd hire hungry every time. It's just the question is, how do you know somebody's hungry who comes into your office? You know, what, what, are, the, what are the attributes uh, or the markers on her resume and experience that speak to hunger? Um, but hunger is one, and then the second is just learning how to learn. I'll tell you, I, spend, I said to Reince Priebus when he came into the office, I said, I can, here's the one thing that'll surprise you. The number one issue that will cross your desk more often than you think right now is technology, every single day. I spend time on technology policy questions, on leak questions, on cyber questions. I said, you just have to get smart on technology. So a skill that allows you to demonstrate hunger and allows you to um, learn how to learn are two very important attributes, full stop. Second thing is, I think we, in universities, uh, I challenge universities to do a better job of this, but I think societally we do a bad job of this, is somehow we're overly focused on the 30% who get a college degree, and we forget that there's 70% of people in the economy who are confronting a dramatically changing landscape. And we're not preparing them well to succeed. And so, there, uh, so I think the long and short of it is we got to grow the 30% more people through college, and we have to get more serious about affordable, available, employable skills for the rest of uh, our economy. And without intentionality on that, it's not going to happen, and we can't leave that uh, to the private sector. I think this is a governmental function. So how about right here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the question was, uh, was it cool hanging around the White House with the Obamas? <laughs> and, and secondly, how do we bring the country back together? And um, uh, Yeah, look, it was cool to go to the White House every day. I was, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you about that. Uh, but you know, it's not all fun and games, uh, I'll tell you that. I got, I'll, early when I was chief of staff, I got a call from the president's scheduler. She said, uh, president would like to see you. It was around lunchtime. I thought this, oh, interesting. Uh, I said, okay. She said he's in the private dining room. I said, okay. So I looked at his schedule to make sure he wasn't in lunch with somebody because I figured I was getting invited to lunch, maybe. And, and so, sure enough, he's eating alone. So I'm thinking, this is great, being chief of staff, you get to have lunch with the president. Love it. I'm like, no, 
navy bean soup for me, or no, leftovers today, baby, I'm going big. <laughs> so I come down there, walk through the oval, get to the private dining room, there's one place sitting in front of him. <laughs> he says, sit down. He didn't invite me to sit at his place. All right. So I wasn't there for lunch, man, I was on the menu. <laughs> and so, so, being chief of staff is a fun job, you know, you get driven around, and, but holy mackerel, all you got is one turd sandwich after the other, you know? <laughs> so, so yeah, it was cool sometimes, but mostly not. Um, I will say he loves the White Sox, okay? And one time early in the administration, I worked with the Intel guys to sneak uh, something into his book in the morning. It was late summer. Uh, I forget if it was 09 or 10. But you'll recall that the Twins were in uh, you know, stretch heat with the White Sox to win the American League Central. And the Twins swept the White Sox. So I, fit, I asked the Intel guys to sneak the AP story into his briefing book. And he's flipping open, and he got to that, and he just looked at me, and he's crumpled up. He says, I don't even know why I keep you around. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. I miss it. I miss the team. Uh, I miss you know, uh, the feeling of serving the country. And uh, um, yeah, and, and, and I miss the, the sense that we're all in this together. And I think that's the, the answer to your next question, which is somehow uh, we've learned the lesson that was obvious to anybody who's been watching the world forever, which is that a leader can lead or a leader can divide. And you can win on division. Okay. All you have to do is look at Robert Mugabe, you know, Augusto Pinochet, and you win by dividing, but the country loses. And so how do we get back by, you know, leading? We get back to the things that make this country great. Openness, transparency, expertise. The things that you teach these students. You don't teach Tommies to be Republicans or Democrats, although it turns out a lot more of them, including my buddies, are Republicans. <laughs> but you sure teach them to be discerning, reliant on expert information. <coughs> and so when we get back to that, I think we'll be fine. I think that's it. Uh, there's like five people in the background saying this. <laughs> Somebody else is going. <laughs> so I think we're done. Thank you all very much. So very grateful to Dennis, and uh, we really appreciate those genuine thoughts and your wisdom that you've gleaned over your years of fabulous experience. Thank you for sharing. Uh, just quick wrap up, I want to thank our sponsors, our premier sponsor, Minnesota Bank and Trust, our two gold sponsors, Stinson Electric and the Executive Education Programs at the Opus College of Business. Also want to thank our season table hosts and our volunteers from the Student Alumni Council. And finally, I want to invite you back on November 2nd, where we will be here to hear from Tom Horner, president of Horner Strategies and a former gubernatorial candidate, and TPT political reporter Mary Lahammer. That is time just before the midterm elections, and you can guess what the topic is. So again, thank you for being with us, and have a great homecoming and family weekend. Thank you very much. <laughs>